All right, the book of James, a letter of James wrote to the 12 tribes in dispersion, he says. There were three James mentioned in the New Testament. Two of them were disciples. James, the brother of John, he was martyred by Herod early in church history. That's recorded in Acts chapter 12. Kind of eliminates him from the, the process. The other was James, the son of Alphaeus, and we hear nothing about him after the resurrection. So by process of elimination, we truly believe, and going back to the first century, that it's James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was the author of this letter. And church historians have agreed throughout the centuries. But we know from Scripture that he didn't believe or respect his brother in the early phases of his ministry. John, chapter 7, verse 5, John writes, Even his own brothers did not believe in him. And if we go to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, uh, his family became alarmed at the crowds were attracting. And Mark 3.21 says they went to seize him for they said he's out of his mind. And at the cross, when the gospel writers were naming those who stayed with Jesus at the cross, they list Mary's mother, but not a word is mentioned of his brothers at that time. But that all changed following the resurrection. Paul records in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7 that the risen Christ appeared to James. And perhaps that's when... He became a believer at the moment when he saw the resurrected Christ. Uh, we believe that's probably when it happened. But if we look at the book of Acts and Paul's letter to Galatians, we learn that James became a well-respected leader in the Jerusalem church. He was instrumental in that agreement we know as the Jerusalem Council. And that's in Acts 15. Uh, this was a document that was agreed upon by the early church. Basically it said this, that Gentile con converts to Christianity do not have to obey the Jewish laws and customs in order to become Christians. And so at James' leading, the council established that both Jews and Gentiles alike are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what came out of the Jerusalem Council. The early church, James acquired the title James the Just. The church historian Hegesippus, if you pronounce it that way, wrote about his extraordinary godliness, his obedience to the law, and his desire to see righteousness in others. And it's said that um, James spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees looked like camel's knees. He spent that much time in prayer from the calluses that he had built up. Historians Josephus and Eusebius both agree that uh, James was martyred in AD 62. He was martyred because he was thrown off the parapet of the temple because he would not renounce Christ. And then when he hit the ground, he was finished off with a club beaten to death by a club. And that was A.D. 62. That was the end of his life. So if we look at the, the date, the timing of this letter, we know it had to be before 62. And the, um, he opens up the letter. If you look there in, in one chapter 1 of James, verse 1, he addresses it to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. And most likely, he's referencing those who had fled Jerusalem after the martyrdom of Stephen. This included both Jewish and Gentile Christians. Here's how Luke says, if you go to Acts chapter 8, Luke says this, he says, And there arose on that day, this is following the martyrdom of Stephen, there arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they're all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. This was the year A.D. 44. So looking at 44 is a possible earliest date, 62 is the latest date, Historians have looked at some things and they said, well, you know what, this letter does not even mention anything about the lead up to Jerusalem Council, which was A.D. 49. So they pretty much have agreed this was a pretty early letter, maybe even as early as A.D. 45, so just a dozen years after the crucifixion. If that's the case, um, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest book in the New Testament, and it predates both the Jerusalem Council and Paul's letters. So there's a debate about when it was Galatians first, it was James first, but James is really pretty early, if you put it to that date. Again, we don't know for certain. We do know also it's what's called a circular letter. So it's written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. It wasn't written to one person. It was written, probably copied and sent to very many places. So it would be read by lots of Christians who were under persecution. So it's what we call a circular letter. Then we have what's called the occasion, or the reason for the writing. The book of James has been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. 59 imperatives and 108 verses. 59 exhortations. It's telling you a lot of things. This is what you need to do. 
And in these five chapters, he's concerned about the welfare of those going through persecution. This would include Gentile Christians, but his main audience would be primarily Jewish Christians. He writes to tell them that the trials are a testing of your faith, as we see that. Um, and this testing will result in steadfastness if you persevere through it. He stresses the display of faith in the believer's life by his or her participation in good works. He places a premium on controlling one's tongue. We'll talk about that a little bit. And also, he talks about um, those who would seek to make a living somewhere without even consulting the one who made them, and they would not go about um, worldly gain to the detriment of their souls. Who would do that? That's what you know, Jesus said. Was it profit man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? James has the same thought process there. Much like Hebrews, it was one of the final books added to the New Testament. We talked about that the last two weeks. The Hebrews was a late added addition to the canon, probably the late 4th century before James was added to it. Um, there have been many opponents of James throughout the centuries. One of the most vocal opponents of the book of James was Martin Luther, who called James an epistle of straw. He didn't think much of James. The reason being, uh, it doesn't speak enough about Jesus, he said. It never mentions the Holy Spirit. And he believed from reading it and studying it that James is promoting justification by works. And so we'll take a look at this issue in just a few moments. That's, that's a major thing we're going to look at from chapter 2. So that's a little background on James. And there's a, we can do a little brief outline of it. It's five chapters. We had the greeting there in chapter 1, verse 1. that has introduction, a body, and a conclusion. It, he does not have a typical benediction like we see in Paul's letters. He just ends with uh, telling us some things to do. And so the introduction is really addressed in chapter 1. We call it the path to true Christian maturity. So trials and tests of faith and obeying the word of God. And then the body of the letter, which we would the overview would be the nature of true faith and the need for repentance and patience. So that's chapter 2, verse 1 to the middle of chapter 5. So that covers the main body. So we're looking at such things as faith in the law. That's the first part of chapter 2. And then if we were assign a thesis statement to it, that would be that passage we're going to look at, the faith and works. That's from chapter 2, 14 through 26, verses 14 26. And that's genuine faith results in works. And that's what's been debated. We'll look at that here a little bit. Chapter 3, the first part, taming the tongue. Ooh, that hurts all of us. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, proper and improper use of wisdom. And at the end of the rest of chapter 3, the first part of chapter 4, submission to God's will. And then there's uh, a warning to the rich and the arrogant from chapter 4, verse 13 to 5, verse 6. And then 5 ends with, well, the middle part of 5, an exhortation to patience. And then the conclusion is this little section on prayer. The importance of prayer, faithful prayer. So that's a brief outline of what to expect. But I, I put out some major themes that we want to look at here. Um, and it will involve reading some of the text. So if you have it there, you can follow along. If you just want to listen, that's fine too. I'm reading from the ESV. But we'll look at perseverance in the midst of trials. That's one of the main things he was putting forward here. Uh, the second thing would be proper Christian living. <clears throat> How important it is to take the words of Christ and to live by what God's word tells us. Third would be faith and works. We're going to look at that passage in a little more detail. And then finally, we'll look at prayer. As James ends the book talking about prayer, we'll end our session today talking about prayer. So let's look first of all then at perseverance in the midst of trials. And he said James addresses his letter to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Now the original meeting would go back to the Syrian Babylonian captivities and the exiles and those who were dispersed after that. Uh, the New Testament context, though, they fled to Judea due to the persecution of Christians. But here, in God's providence, what they've done, they've taken the gospel with them. Remember, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the earth. So this is God's way, as we see under persecution, they take the gospel with them when they go out. And so the name of Christ, the gospels are being spread among those who have gone out from them. So believers are now grafted in Jesus Christ, the true Israel. Jewish and Gentile Christians are the true Israel because they are grafted in Christ. For your homework, you can read Romans 9. Paul talks all about it. That's your homework this afternoon. 
Look at, if you read James and then look at Romans 9, we talk about being the true Israel. And so we see, even next week, we look at 1 Peter. He addresses his letter, the first uh, letter of Peter, to uh, the elect exiles of this version. So he has a similar audience that Peter will be looking at next week. But he says, you know, remaining steadfast under the trials is a key point. It's what James is, is, is really hitting here in the first section of the letter. He writes that the one who perseveres will receive the crown of life. The crown of life. And along the way, he gives us a lesson on temptation and sin. So open your Bibles there, chapter 1. Look at verses 2 to 4. This seems counterintuitive. In our small groups, we're studying James, and we've been over this verse. It says, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then drop down to verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one says, say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he, he himself tempts no one. So here's our lesson. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. And flip over to chapter 5. He revisits this same theme of perseverance. He says, remain steadfast. But he tells the readers, really three times in this little passage you're going to look at, the Lord is coming soon. So we even have a, a, a theology here that James brings out very early an eschatology of the returning of Christ. Chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. Something was very common in Israel. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. Here it is again. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of steadfastness of Job. You've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Remain steadfast. A similar lesson to what we heard in Hebrews, right? Persevere through trials. Don't turn back. Persevere through it. Look at the, and a, a Job, I mean, he looks at Job here, so James is assuming that his audience, you know, being a Jewish audience, would be familiar with the Old Testament passages. That was his target audience. So that's perseverance in the midst of trials. Let's look at proper Christian living. This is what we call the, the Proverbs portion of the New Testament. It's one exhortation after another to, to proper living. Uh, this is what we would call Jewish wisdom, full of Jewish wisdom. Look, go back to chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, chapter 1. Verse 19 is one I would often uh, recite to my son when he was younger. <laughs> Look what it says. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I always say the Lord gave you two ears and one mouth. There's a reason for that. <laughs> verse 20. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Again, you see James really early in the New Testament canon putting emphasis on God's word, how important that is. It, has, it, it, it blesses your souls and saves your souls. If we look at chapter 2, he warns against giving preferential treatment to the wealthy while discriminating against the poor. We have a tendency sometimes to do that. And use this as a kind of a springboard to go into the moral law. He closes the portion to tell us that mercy triumphs over judgment. Look there in chapter 2. He gives a little scenario here about partiality. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So he, there, there's that, we talk about him not being a believer, but now he says he's the Lord of glory. He's seen the resurrected Christ. That was my brother. And now I know who he is. He says, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, 
And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in the good place, why you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So you think about that. Flip over to verse 8. 8 to 13. And he's going to look at, he's, he's, he's introducing us to this portion of looking at faith by how we live. Okay? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, verse 8 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Here, I can still hear R.C. Sproul saying you've committed cosmic treason against God by violating his law, punishable by death. So James is introducing that here. He says, for who's, he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who would be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who's shown no mercy. Ah, but mercy triumphs over judgment. And where does the mercy come? It comes in the blood of Christ. So that mercy is, is by far greater than the judgment will come. And that's the place that we go to hide. We hide under the, the lordship of Jesus Christ. So, wonderful words there. Chapter 3 then. Oh boy. Here we go. Taming the tongue. He tells us how powerful speech can be. How a small part of the body can produce deadly results. You, you, you say those words and you may be grieved by them. But you can't take them back. They're already in your hearers' ears and in their memory. And so it can have lasting effects. Think about the words of Jesus in Matthew 15. He says, and he was accused of, uh, disciples were accused of eating without washing their hands. Right? Remember that portion in Matthew 15. Jesus said, you know what? It's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, but rather what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. So in other words, your actions and your words display what's in your heart. That's the point he's trying to make here. So if you look at uh, chapter 3, 6 to 10, this little portion of this, these are familiar words if you've been through James at all. Verse 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. It goes on. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Right? Again, that's, that's, that's practical living, but also looking at this is how we, you know, if we control that tongue, we spend more time in prayer. Listen more than you talk. All those things are good practical ways for Christians to live. We also then come to uh, this section about he's talking against the pride and arrogance of people. Uh, this is, he quotes Proverbs 3.34, which we have in other places in Scripture. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. We've heard that before. And that opposition is more like a stiff arm. He's not just against them. He's offensively against them. Uh, he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. They are in opposition to each other. Why is that? The world hates God. There's no one here today that would choose God if we were on our own without God coming into our lives and changing our hearts, we would flee from Him. We would curse Him. The world in general I speak of, it hates His holiness. It hates His law. It hates His Son. It hates His Spirit. And it hates His mercy. You can preach the gospel to people and they hear it and it goes one in and out the other. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's an act of God through His Holy Spirit to bring us to repentance. And so... Friendship with the world, we can see it really in our culture now, some of the things going on. If you're a friend with that, you're an enemy of God because they are disagreeing with each other. And that's what, 2,000 years ago, he's saying the same thing we know now. So, finally then, James speaks to those who carry on their financial lives, giving no thought to the God who created them. This is in chapter 4, 13 to 17. 
Again, a passage that we're familiar with. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you don't know what, your, what tomorrow will bring. What is your life for your mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you're bo you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So, you're going to go out and do this and that. He ends with saying, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Recently, I, I was blessed to hear a sermon on this very passage from Martin Lloyd-Jones. If you've ever heard the Welsh preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he has a wonderful... If you get a chance, you can go uh, just type in MLJ Trust and you can look for this. It's wonderful. It's, it's a lengthy sermon, but it's well worth it. Um, okay, bring us to our next topic. Faith and works. Faith and works. This specifically is going to focus on verses 14 to 26 of chapter 2. This is a passage that's been debated and argued and analyzed throughout the centuries. Uh, some say James is in opposition to Paul, advocating justification by works. And that was part of Luther's argument. You've got to think about Luther, though. He's coming out of a, a Roman tradition that held captive for so long. And even the scent of good works meriting salvation brought out his wrath, and just, justifiably so. That's why he called him the epistle of straw. It was one of those things that he didn't quite agree with. But let's look what James is really saying. I'm going to read it in context, and then we'll look at a couple of things here. And look at some other scripture. So this is uh, chapter 2, 14 to 26. We'll read this, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And he says, Look here. He says, you believe in, that God is one, you do well. Even demons believe and shudder. In other words, they know God's word. They know who Christ is, but they don't know him. They don't, they're not worshiping him. And so they show no faith in him. So it's not enough just to know God's word, right? Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as a righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So you hear those things, well, okay, that sounds interesting, but to be truthful here, the James and Paul are in perfect agreement along with Jesus himself. I mean, we'll look at this for a second. If good works do not result from our profession of faith, it really shows that we don't possess the faith. And remember, he said James' letter is probably written before Paul's. So Paul would not be in opposition to James. Um, I always like to say they're... They're like two, two, the railroad tracks are parallel to each other, going down the same way. Let's look at what Paul said. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. What does, what does Paul write? He's, these are the words we know. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works. So no one may boast. Right? We agree with that so far. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do them. As we said in Deuteronomy, you, you know the law, but you've got to do it. All right? Jesus said himself, Matthew 7, verse 21, Sermon on the Mount. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The will of my Father who is in heaven. There's a, there is a quote from uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 10. Moses speaking to the Israelites in this context of James being the, uh, the Jewish scholar. This is what he says. This is what Moses said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 10. He says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? 
but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I'm commanding you today for your good. That requires faith, but also requires activity to show that you have that faith. And that's what James is writing about here. So the Bible's in agreement throughout. So when James declares that faith without works is dead, he's saying that such faith cannot justify anyone. It's not a living faith. Really, the end product of the living faith is good works. And done in thanksgiving for what's been done for us in Christ. That's why we go out and show that we have faith. And that's what James was saying. So if you hear that argument, you know, James is against Paul and vice versa. That's not true. That's not true. And I'm not ever going to stand here and say I could debate Martin Luther. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I'd get shot down in a second. And he's not here to defend himself anyway. But I disagree with his thinking on that. So, fourthly, we come to prayer. Prayer. James places a premium on prayer. He exhorts Christians to pray in all circumstances. Just like Paul. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he says, pray without ceasing. And so James has that same thinking. Uh, chapter 5, 13 to 18. This is almost the end of the letter. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And then a reference to, we've been going through 1 Kings. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So what's this thing here in the middle? I, I want to interject here a little bit. Uh, the James is not speaking of the Roman Catholic tradition of what we call last rites, or extreme unction, where they bring in the priests and they anoint somebody who's dying. Um, they, they, Calvin says they, they've taken it to a dark place. Here's what Calvin wrote. He says, these people soil with their grease, not the sick, but... Body's half dead when the soul's about to expire. That's not what James is talking about here. Rather, James is writing to Christians to encourage them to acknowledge God's sovereignty in all things. Pray, sing praise, call the elders, confess your sins. All these are examples of our faith. So we'll end with this. As one commentator put it, he said, James is simply giving directions in a few different situations. If anyone suffers hardship, let him pray. If anyone's in good spirits, let him praise. If anyone's sick, call the elders. If someone calls the elders, let them pray. And when you confess sins, pray for one another. That's what he's saying here. So James, a uh, very practical book. Hopefully, now you see the context which it was written, the time period it was written. Um, one who became a... a a stalwart in the early church and suffered martyrdom because of his belief. And, and if anyone could speak of persevering through trials, it would be James. He, he paid the ultimate price for the, his faith. So if we have any questions or comments...